Well, I think it's definitely a laudable goal. We need to start with the goal. We need to start with a deadline. If we don't have those two, then, then these things drag on. So it's very difficult to say in advance whether we will be able to meet the goal. But I think President Obama establishing the goal, uh, setting out a deadline, presents a very important challenge. It also tells people that they have work to do. Uh, they should not waste time in terms in polemics, uh, but identify what the issues are and, and to work at them. So I think in that sense, uh, for, for that particular purpose, the Security Summit in April next year will be a very important uh, event. It'll have about 40 countries coming to that meeting at the level of heads of state and government, um, which will be geographically diverse and representative. Uh, representative. So I think that will provide a strong impetus. And then the, the next Nuclear Security Summit, uh, at the invitation of President Obama, the Russian president accepted to do that, and I think that will be sometime in July or so 2011. So there already is a follow-up uh, planned and agreed to the 2010 Nuclear Security oh, Summit. Okay, so these two, I think, will be important benchmarks in, in moving towards meeting the, the four-year deadline. When you bring heads of state together, then it focuses the energies of the government. Ministers can come and talk and agree, but if they don't have the support from the highest level, um, it's not the same. And when the chief executive of a country, the leader of a country, is putting a marker down, then it shows to the bureaucrats and the policymakers of that country that that's the priority. And when this can be shared, so 40 countries is about 25% of the countries of the world. So that's an, it's an important starting point. Uh, and President Obama still has very high level of uh, credibility out internationally, so this is a good time to, to draw on that. Um, and I think the U.S. is now trying to say that we are not, not only talking the talk, but we will also do the stuff. Well, sometimes we get the reputation of always having a tin cup in our hand, you know, to drop pennies right. into it. But this organization has been under a zero rail growth uh, budget regime for more than 25 years, which means for more than 25 years, the growth in our budget has compensated for inflation, but it has not increased the budget in rail terms. But in the meantime, we have been asked to do more and more. So we, we are doing a good job on nuclear security. We have a budget for nuclear security, but this is voluntary. It is something that is not mandatory for countries to provide money to us. So this is purely voluntary, pure, uh, purely at, at their whim. So if they can find money, they give it to us. If they don't, they may not. Also, these voluntary contributions come with many strings attached, that one can only spend this money in a particular way. And while there is nothing wrong in giving us money with some strings attached, there comes a time when if too many strings are attached, then it takes away from our flexibility. Um, I sometimes point out that our annual safeguards budget is a little bit less than the salary of David Beckham, a football player, or I don't know, one of the leading football, uh, baseball players for the New York Yankees could easily pay our verification budget for a year so that shows the distance between the rhetoric of leaders who on the one hand say that nuclear security, nuclear nonproliferation is the highest priority and the funding that they are prepared to devote to that through an international organization. It's also much, much less than the cost of a single day of military action in Iraq or Afghanistan. So we, we need to keep those types of comparisons in mind when we talk about the IAEA. Well, what a fissile material control treaty would do is it would prohibit the production of nuclear material for nuclear weapons. And there are essentially two principal types of nuclear material used for nuclear weapons, highly enriched uranium and plutonium. So again, um, there are nine countries that possess nuclear weapons. So a fissile material control treaty would really apply to these nine countries. All other countries that are parties to the non-proliferation treaty 
and do, countries do not have nuclear weapons, they already legally are barred from producing any uranium or plutonium that could be used for weapons. So an FMCT is really for nine countries, the five permanent members of the Security Council or the five nuclear weapon states, and then uh, three or four other countries who are outside the NPT and also have nuclear weapons. So a fissile material control treaty, A, would prohibit the production of material for nuclear weapons. There would need to be a declaration of the production facilities that exist. They would need to be brought under verification to make sure that no new material is produced. There would need to be a discussion what to do with existing stocks of such material. Uh, at the moment, this is a matter where there is no agreement. Some countries want to exempt existing stocks and therefore a fissile material control treaty would only look forward as of a certain date, no new material. But a strong argument can also be made that we need to also take into account historical production and, and to put that under some sort of international monitoring as well. And there needs to be verification too. Uh, but the treaty would be global. It would apply to all countries, but its immediate effect would be on, on, on nine countries. And this would also have an important um, effect in bringing nuclear material, which is on the military side, under some level of international scrutiny and monitoring. So in that sense, it's a very important treaty. People characterize this as the next logical step in nuclear arms control. Um, we hope that negotiations can start on this at the Conference on Disarmament, which is the world's sole multilateral nuclear arms control negotiation forum.